Well, we started a a message last week that we're going to conclude today out of the book of Jonah. And we said last week that the big idea of the book of Jonah is actually contained in a prayer that Jonah prayed from the belly of a great fish. And it concludes with this kind of crescendo. And it's right at the center of the book. And it's Jonah chapter 2 verse 9 when he says, salvation comes from the Lord. Okay, so that's the summary of the book of Jonah. Actually, we could say that's actually a summary of the entire Bible, that salvation comes from the Lord. And and it's applied really in the book of Jonah in two ways. They're kind of twin peaks, if you will, twin ideas. The first is salvation comes from the Lord individually. And so in the story, Jonah is a runaway prophet. He was disobedient to God. And yet, even in his disobedience, God saves him. He spares his life. So salvation comes from the Lord. If you're an individual here today and you're running from God, he's got your number. And salvation comes from the Lord. But it's not just individually. That's what we looked at last week. This week, I want to look at the the last part of the book of Jonah. And it's salvation comes from the Lord corporately. Because God had mercy on Nineveh. And and, and if you're going to read the book, one of the things that's going to jump right out at you is this. God's heart is for the city. I I don't know if you're like me recently. My my heart has been moved for our city, for for our nation. I had great concern and urgency for Louisville, for for the the nation of America. And, and, And if you're anything like me, it's a good thing to hear that God's heart is for our city. God's heart is for souls to turn to him and be saved. You you, you may have heard the old saying, and and a lot of Christians kind of think this way, God created the world, man created the suburbs, but the devil made the city. And that's the idea a lot of Christians have. But nothing could be further from the truth biblically. Many years ago, uh, Floyd McClung wrote a book entitled Seeing the City with the Eyes of God, which is kind of a great thing. I pray that we do that today. We see the city with the eyes of God. And he begins the book with this sentence. The Bible begins in a garden, but ends in a city. The new Jerusalem, right in the end, the new heavens and the new earth, when the new Jerusalem comes, it is, it's the great city. It is the, the garden city where we're all headed, the city of God. And while we are currently already citizens of that city, Philippians 3.20 says our citizenship is in heaven, Even though that's true, we're supposed to be praying for and working for the good of the earthly city so that our earthly city looks more like the heavenly city. And this is why Jesus told us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, our calling as Christians isn't escapism. We aren't, our call, the Bible is not about the fact, hey, we're going to escape this dirty, yucky earth, and then we're going to get to heaven and just say, to hell with all of that. That's not God's heart. That's not our calling. We're supposed to be kingdom people here on the earth to bring the kingdom of heaven here on the earth. That's why even in the Old Testament, God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah when when his people were in exile and said this, Jeremiah 29 verse 7, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And here they were in Babylon. I mean, if there was ever a time where God's people would be justified in being hostile to the city, it was in Babylon. But God said, don't be hostile to the city. You pray for it. Pray for it. And now to see a beautiful picture of this, we need to pick up in the story where we left off in Jonah. Um, Last week, you remember, for those of you who weren't here, Jonah uh, is told by God, God has the first word in chapter 1. He said, I want you to go to the great city of Nineveh. And Jonah said, nope. I'm going the other way. He starts heading the other way, goes down to Joppa, gets a ticket on a boat to Tarshish. He's hiding on the way, and God sends a great storm. The sailors get upset. Jonah's down in the bottom. He's sleeping. They wake him up. What have you done? We're crying out to our gods, but nothing is happening. He said, well, I serve the God who made heaven and earth, you know, and all your gods, they're nothing. But I've been running away, so throw me in the sea. And they're like, no, we don't want to throw in your sea. They try everything else. Nothing works. So they go, God, forgive us, and they throw him in the sea. Because they want to go home to their families. They throw them into the sea. Then they begin to fear God because the sea is calmed. Uh, 
God appoints or ordains a great fish to go and swallow him, and, and he swallows Jonah, and, and, and in the belly of the fish, Jonah prays, because there was no Xbox in the belly. There was nothing else to do, and he prays, and he seeks God. And God sends the fish and he vomits him back up on land. And we pick up the story, Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Verse 3. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. All of a sudden, Jonah is motivated now. It may not be the purest form of motivation, okay? It might just be the, Jesus, I just love you so much, you know, I'm going to, no. It's, I don't want to be in the belly of a fish anymore. So it's mixed motives. Not too unlike you and I. Right? I mean, uh, let's be honest. A lot of times we, our motives aren't entirely pure. I heard a story about a sergeant who was uh, told by his commanding officer to sell life insurance to his soldiers, and he went and said, uh, to his soldiers, he said, listen, uh, for just a few bucks a week taken out of your paycheck, you can get a life insurance policy for $100,000. If you die, then your, your family will get $100,000. And none of the soldiers wanted to buy it. And so he went back and told his commanding officer, he said, none of the soldiers wanted to buy it. And, the, and his commanding officer said, well, did you motivate them? He said, what do you mean? He said, follow me. He goes back to the soldiers. He says, guys, anybody want to buy life insurance for just a few dollars a week? You can have an insurance policy where if you die, your family gets $100,000. Nobody wanted it. He said, let me put it this way. We're getting ready to go into battle. Who do you think the army's going to put on the front line? Somebody that if they die, they got to pay $100,000 to your family? Or some of you goofballs that ain't got no insurance? All of a sudden, they all signed up for the insurance. Now, look, that might not be the purest form of motivation, but to be honest with you, that's us. That's Jonah here. It's not the purest form of motivation. And he goes to Nineveh with mixed motives, and he just preaches judgment. If you read the text, there's no grace. There's no four spiritual laws. You know, no, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. There's no two ways to live. This is not even turn or burn, baby. It's not even that. It's just burn. That's it. 40 days, you guys are toast, okay? You're doomed. It's grilling season. I have a front row seat for this. And then the unthinkable happens. Nineveh, which is as wicked as any city ever in the history of the earth, repents. All of them, the text says, all of them from the greatest to the least, from the king all the way down to the youngest kid in preschool. And chapter 3, verse 5 says this, the Ninevites believed God. We said last week, those those four words ought to make you never, ever despair again about the future of our city. Because if the Ninevites can believe God, if Nineveh can repent and turn to God, Louisville can do the same. We can ne- we're never allowed to be hopeless as followers of Jesus. We're not allowed to be hopeless and in despair because we've got hope. The Ninevites believe God. And what happens? God responds in verse 10, when God saw what they did, And how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion. And did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Listen, repentance touches God's heart. Repentance touches God's heart. And and, and if you're here and you're like, repentance, that sounds like a a church word. Uh, It actually, in Greek, the word was metanoia. And in the Greek military, it was the word for an about face. So when a commanding officer wanted him to say, about face, he would say metanoia. And it meant just turn around. And, and when, when somebody turns around, it, it touches the heart of God. And he's faithful to his promises. And still today, God's will for our Ninevehs, for Washington, D.C., for Moscow, for London, Beijing and Amsterdam, Las Vegas and Paris, Riyadh and Baghdad and Kabul and Bogota and Madrid and Louisville. His will for them, God's heart for the city is the same. Mercy and grace and redemption. If we will only repent, God's heart for, is for our city. And if God is for it, how can you and I be against it? Timothy Keller's planted a, a bunch of churches in Manhattan and, and, and in New York City, and, and, and he says this in his book, Center Church. 
Cities have more of the image of God per square inch than any other place on earth. See, you've never met a human being that wasn't made in the image of God, and so there's more human beings in cities, right? So there's more of the image of God per square inch in the city than any other place on earth. And so when a city repents, it touches God's heart. And one of the lessons that you get out of the book of Jonah, if you don't get anything else, is this. God is attracted to brokenness. I mean, if you as an individual are here today and you're just and you're in a broken place and you're like, I, I just, I'm, I need God. You know, we sing that song, I need you. Oh, I need, and that was coming just out of your heart as you were singing that today. Good news, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And he's attracted to brokenness. And, if, and if, uh, in, in, in what is it, Luke chapter 15, Jesus says, there's more rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repents than if 99 who don't need to repent. Heaven loves it when somebody turns. God is attracted to brokenness. The same is true for a nation. When a nation stops and turns back to God, God is attracted to that. He said this in, in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. This is in the context of Solomon dedicating the temple. God's saying, here's what's going to happen, and here's when it happens. If you do this, I'll do this. Here's what he says. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. And if you don't get anything else from that verse, get this. We have the ability, as the people of God, to affect our city and this nation. Do you believe that? If you believe that verse, you have to believe that. We have the ability, as the people of God, to affect our city and this nation. And if things aren't being healed, if things aren't going well in our city, maybe it's not the pagans we should blame. Maybe we have some responsibility. You know, there's a story told in, in Genesis 18 and 19 about a place called Sodom. Now, don't read this story right now because it's kind of depressing, okay? Only read this when the sun is shining and you're feeling good, okay? But there's a story in, 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 about this place called Sodom. And if you read it carefully, you, you discover that Sodom was destroyed ultimately not because of the presence of the unrighteous, but the absence of ten righteous men. God said his judgment is coming, and Abraham plays the role of an intercessor. You remember the story? He, and he goes and says, look, would you actually destroy a whole city if there were 50 righteous men there? And God goes, all right, for 50 I won't do it. He said, what, what about 45? Would, for, would you destroy it for 45? And God says, okay, I won't do it for 45. Moses says, or not Moses, Abraham. Yeah, just so we're clear, it's Abraham. Although Moses kind of did this kind of intercession too. But Abraham in this story says, what about 40? How about 30? Have you thought about 30? What about, if I found mercy, in, what about 20? He goes all the way down to 10 and God says, fine. For 10 righteous men, I won't destroy. And he couldn't find 10 righteous. Listen, it wasn't Sodom and Gomorrah weren't destroyed because of the presence of the unrighteous. It was the absence of ten righteous men who could humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways. So this is what we're going to do today. We're going to humble ourselves. And a few moments from now, we're going to spend some time in prayer. We're going to seek his face and we're going to turn because his promise is to hear our cry, to heal. Back to the story. Um, go back to Jonah. Jonah says, preaches, judgment, everybody repents. So everything's great, right? I mean, most prophets never get this kind of success. Most prophets, you know, get cut in half or thrown in a cistern or whatever. So Jonah now should be pretty happy. I mean, not only did he not get killed, everybody repents. He can send the granddaddy of all appeal newsletters because he's got numbers to share now. So he should be ecstatic, right? wrong he's ticked chapter 4 verse 1 but Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry he prayed to the Lord oh Lord is this not what I said when I was still at home? I told you this was gonna happen that is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you're gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, just 
take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. Now I want you to see a couple things out of this verse right here. First of all, Jonah's attitude is horrible. I mean, get this. He's mad at God because God didn't send fire from heaven and fry him like he did Sodom. That's what he's upset about. Now, I find this very encouraging. And You say, what? Encur- yes, very encouraging. Think of it this way. Have you ever heard anyone say something like this? God won't use a dirty vessel. You ever heard anybody say that? God won't use a dirty vessel. And, and, and what they usually mean when they're saying that is, you got to have it all together before God will use you. Like, you got to have all your ducks in a row. Your portfolio's got to be properly diversified. you got to never say a bad word. God won't use a dirty vessel. But here's what I want to say reading this story. What in the world is Jonah if not a dirty vessel? He's selfish. He's hard-hearted. He's violent. He has no mercy, even though a few verses earlier, he's crying out to God for mercy in the belly of a fish. He wants mercy for himself and judgment for everybody else. He's a hypocrite. I mean, the bottom line is this. Jonah is a jerk. And God used a jerk to save an entire nation of people. I feel very encouraged by that. (laughs) Because I preach a lot. And I'm a jerk sometimes. I mean, just sometimes. Not all the the time. You know, sorry. I preach a lot, and, 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 and sometimes, you know what the feeling is? I'm not perfect. I'm not good enough. And sometimes I feel like, Lord, I, I, I'm trying to get good enough to kind of earn his anointing or try to get good enough to, to find a, when his blessing. And when I feel that way, if I will just remember Jonah, because, look, I have never asked God to burn you guys up. <laughs> never. I have never done. I mean, there's a couple of you. I have asked him to give you a tummy ache because you weren't responsive to my leadership. But other than that... I've never gone beyond, no, I'm kidding, sort of. But no, the point is this. Jonah didn't have everything together. Jonah wasn't perfect. And you know what this leads me to believe? The power of God is not limited to our perfection. Isn't this good news? I mean, I think of it sometimes as a parent. Sometimes as a parent, you know, we're concerned about our kids and we're praying for them. And we know we've made mistakes. And the only parent who hasn't made a mistake is the person who's not a parent. There was only ever one perfect parent, that was God, and his children rebelled. And sometimes when we're praying for our kids, we think, man, I screwed it up, I messed it up. And, you know. But listen, God's power is not limited to how perfect a parent you were. And some people, you know what happens? They, they never reach out to anybody. They never take a risk. They never witness to anybody. They never pray for somebody because they think, I'm not perfect. And, and, and if I'm not perfect, God's not going to use me. And here's what happens. They become bound by their failure in the past. And the past becomes a life sentence. And the past begins to define what is available for your future. But listen, as a follower of Jesus, your past does not limit what God can do. So when when you leave here, just know this, Satan's probably going to whisper in your ear, you hypocrite, you can't love this city, you don't even love your wife very well. Or your husband, or your kid, you're not even good at that. Just say, you know what, Satan, why don't you jump in the lake, all right? Because God saved Nineveh through the preaching of a jerk, a selfish prophet. And by the way, my sins were already paid for on the cross. Just by way of side note here, you know, sometimes, you know what we do sometimes? Sometimes we try to add to the work of Christ on the cross. Here's my question. Was the cross enough? So we we very quickly say that, yeah, the cross, because we believe, theologically, we believe the cross was enough. Yes, absolutely. There's nothing that needs, there's nothing left unturned. Jesus did everything he could have done for our salvation. It pays for every single one of our sins we've ever committed or will ever commit, right? We all believe that. And yet, we try to add to his work sometimes by carrying shame as if we're atoning for our sin now. Feeling guilty, beating ourselves up instead of receiving the forgiveness that he already won for us. We beat ourselves up because it's like we're trying to atone. I give you an example just, just this past week. The only time I get to choose what music I listen to is when I'm driving in my car by myself. 
So I'm in the car, and, I'm li- and, I'm, and I've got, you know, sometimes I don't always listen to worship. This may shatter your image of me, but I don't always listen to worship music. Yeah. I know, dad, dad's, I mean, Eddie Van Halen died this way last week, so I had to listen to a little 80s Van Halen. But I was also listening to worship music on this one particular occasion this past week, and I just love the Revelation song. I just love that. I love any worship music that's like exactly what they sing in the book of Revelation. That, that just, I just love it, you know. And so I put that on. I got it turned up. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he, you know, and I'm worshiping. Is this ever happened to you? You're just in a good place, you know, and you're worshiping. Things are good. I have my left hand on the steering wheel, my right hand. I'm going, worthy is the lamb who was slain like this, you know, holy, holy. And somebody cut me off. And it went like this, holy, holy, idiot. And then I realized what I had done. I'm worshiping Jesus. One more. I'm saying, idiot. Then I see it's an elderly gentleman who's like 100 years old, he probably saved the free world in World War II. (laughs) What have I done lately? (laughs) You know, and I'm feeling guilty. So what I do, I go to the slow lane and just start driving real slow. (laughs) Because I'm feeling guilty. I'm trying to atone for my sin in that moment. Trying to, I'm like, God, I'm sorry. And I just feel bad. I suck, man, I'm awful. And I'm just, I'm feeling awful, I'm feeling terrible, and, I'm, and it's like I'm trying to atone for my sin now. Instead of just saying, you know what, Jesus paid for that sin too. Yeah. And I just receive your forgiveness, that's not who I am. Yeah. That is not who I am. I've been made, if anybody's in Christ, he's a new creation. Yeah. The old is gone, the new has come. Yeah. Yeah. I would just apply that to somebody who's here today. Maybe there's some stuff that you've done and... You're trying to earn your forgiveness. You're trying to add to what Jesus did on the cross. You can't do it. So you know what? You might as well just say, I just receive your forgiveness. My, my one defense is Jesus' blood and righteousness, right? Back to the story of Jonah. Second thing I, wa- I want you to see about this right here when he's displeased and he's angry is that Jonah and God actually agreed on a number of theological points. In, in fact, Jonah's theology is pretty good here. He believes, number one, Nineveh is wicked and sinful. God also believes that. Number two, God can save rebels. God believed that. Number three, God's nature is to be gracious and merciful. God believed that. And four, God was likely to act that way. And he was right. Like most of us here, Jonah had pretty good theology. The problem was Jonah didn't have God's heart. Now that is a warning to all of us because you can have laser precise theology and still miss the heart of God. I, I, I've, I've been this guy before, I, I'm, and listen, please, I'm not minimizing the need for good theology. I believe, I teach that what you believe about God is hugely important. In fact, it's the most important thing about you. Uh, your view of God is the top button in the shirt. You know, if you put the, a button in the wrong hole, then all of them are going to be out of order. Well, the, your view of God is the top button in your shirt. When you get that button in, everything else falls into place. But here's the deal. You can have the doctrine of Christ and not the spirit of Christ. You can have head knowledge and miss God's heart. And that's what happened with Jonah. It's what happens a lot in our country when we're right. But we don't have God's spirit, his heart. We're, but, but look, it's not, you know, Jonah wasn't the only one. In Luke chapter 9, there's this great story. Uh, in Luke chapter 9, Jesus goes on a road trip, and it's a long road trip for the Gospel of Luke, from chapter 9 to, I think, chapter 19. He goes on this 11-chapter road trip going to Jerusalem. And right towards the beginning in chapter 9 of Luke, he's going to go into a Samaritan village, but they hear he's going to Jerusalem, and because of their kind of this thing that they have with Jerusalem, they're not going to let Jesus come in. And they're like, no, Jesus is not welcome. And so James and John go to Jesus and say, hey, you want us to call down fire from heaven and burn them up? Burn them up, praise God. That's what they do. And Jesus is like, Did, weren't y'all there when I talked about loving your enemies? Blessing those who curse you, praying for those, you know, who persecute you. Did you, remember, did you miss that lesson? They're ready to burn them up. And they believe the right things. 
But they didn't have the spirit of Christ. And so what did Jesus? Jesus rebuked them. See, James and John and Jonah are like a lot of us who want the benefits of knowing God. We want the blessings of being in covenant with God. We want God to save us and heal us and provide for us and protect us and empower us, but not the responsibility. We like knowing God. We just don't want to make him known to anyone else. And when that is the case, we've missed the heart of God because God's heart is for the nations. God's heart is for the city. I mean, let me ask you a question. Why do you think Jonah was so angry here? Why, why is he filled with hatred and rage against Nineveh? I mean, that's an important question to answer because it, the answer to that question is going to bring us uncomfortably close to home because we're a lot closer to this story than you think. You see, it depends on when you date the book of Jonah. I, I would date it to the 8th century BCE because in 2 Kings 14, verse 25, there's a Jonah ben Amittai, who I think is the same prophet, who prophesied under the reign of Jeroboam II, which is the 8th century BCE, which is just a few years before Assyria, of which Nineveh is the capital, was going to take Israel into captivity. So be Jonah for a second. It's not just that, he, it's not that Jonah is racist, okay? It, 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 it's, it's, this is not just, hey, I just don't like these people. No, if they repent, God is going to bless them, and he's going to use them to discipline your own country. This is personal for Jonah. I mean, compare that to us today. I'm going to ask you a question. Don't answer this one out loud. Most answers I want you to give out loud. This one, you just, to yourself. Answer it to yourself. Who do you think is responsible for destroying our nation? Don't answer out loud. Just in your mind right now. Who do you think is because I Because I, I, and there's going to be different answers. In, in a room like this, there's going to be different answers. Some of you are thinking it's the liberals. Some of you are thinking it's Donald Trump. Some of you are thinking probably the more accurate one, it's Duke fans. Duke fans have ruined this nation. I'm only saying that for our Duke fans in the church who are watching via live stream. Please text me that you still love me. Whoever it is, whoever you think is responsible, let me ask you this question. I want you to imagine, uh, imagine this. Imagine God telling you to go to them. And imagine now that if they repent, God is going to bless them and he's going to use them to discipline you. That's where Jonah was. So before we judge him too quickly, we might have been similar to that. The story's still not over, though. After Jonah whines about God's mercy, which is both kind of funny and sad, if you, if you want to laugh, read, read the message version of this. It's really funny. What I did with some of the pastors this week. We read this and got a, a kick out of it. But after that happens, God gives him an object lesson. God's good with these object lessons, and, and, and he makes a vine grow up for shade for Jonah, and Jonah likes that, but then God sends a worm to chew it up, and he sends the sun to beat down on Jonah, and then Jonah says, it's better for me to die. Chapter 4 and verse 9, he says, but God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. See, Jonah's attitude here goes from bad to worse. Get this, God had mercy on Nineveh but destroyed the plant. Jonah wanted mercy on the plant but for God to destroy Nineveh. And Jonah represents a lot of us who want mercy for ourselves and justice for our enemies, forgetting that, you know what, you guys? We used to be enemies of God. Colossians 1 verse 21, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. We used to be enemies of God. We used to be alienated from God. Ephesians 2 verse 12 puts it this way, remember, don't forget this. It's important for us to remember this. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. That's who we used to be. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Oh, the gospel is incredibly humbling. 
humbling. Why? Because you didn't save yourself. You know what that also means? You can never put yourself above anybody else because at the end of the day, you're just one of the Ninevites. So am I. I, I, I'm, I, I was an enemy of God. And just like them, we have an opportunity now to repent as a nation, to come back. God has given us a time to, to turn back to him. And here's how the story ends. Chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. And that doesn't mean they were not smart. That's just a, that's a Hebrew phrase. They can't tell the right from the left. It means they're morally immature. They don't even understand what they're doing. And many cattle as well. And look at the last sentence of the book. It's a question. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Should I not be concerned? God is asking. God had the first word in chapter 1. He gets the last word in chapter 4. And the last word reveals God's heart for the city. Should I not be concerned about this great? It's like as, as if God is saying, my heart is for the city. My heart is for these people. Your heart ought to be like mine. Thomas John Carlyle wrote a book called You, Jonah, which is a lot of poetry around the book of Jonah. And he's got this one verse in one of the poems which reads, and Jonah stalked to his shaded seat and waited for God to come around to his way of thinking. And God is still waiting for a host of Jonahs in their comfortable houses to come around to his way of loving. Here's what I find absolutely fascinating about this book. Jonah has no ending. You ever notice that? I mean, there's no resolution, there's no denouement, there's no the rest of the story. It just ends with a question. It's God's question. Should I not be concerned about this great city? And, and what did Jonah do? I mean, how did he answer the question? I mean, does he change his heart? Does he say, you know what, God, you're right, I'm a jerk. I, you know, I, forgive me. Does he say that? Or does he go on in his anger? You, you don't know. We don't know what Jonah did, but we can know what we will do. I'll close with this. I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, what did C.S. Lewis think about this? That's what you're thinking. I knew it. And in one of his books in the Chronicles of Narnia, Prince Caspian, there's this great scene where Lucy encounters Aslan, the great lion who represents Jesus Christ. And she's seen him before, but she didn't go to him. And, and, and she tried to tell her friends, sort of, that he was there, but they didn't really believe her. But he did, he wouldn't, she didn't go to her, um, uh, Aslan. And when she finally does meet Aslan, even though he doesn't say it, there's a kind of implicit rebuke that she didn't come to him or, or bring the others to him. And they had this interchange. And here's what happens. You mean, said Lucy rather faintly, that it would have turned out all right somehow? But how? Please, Aslan, am I not to know? To know what would have happened, child, said Aslan? No. Nobody has ever told that. Oh, dear, said Lucy. But anyone can find out what will happen, said Aslan. In other words, what would have happened if you would have obeyed back then, you don't know, and you're not ever going to know that. But what will happen if you obey right now, anybody can know that. You, you can start right where you are in this moment and say, God, I want your heart for this city. I want your heart for this family. I want your heart for our nation. And we can find out what will happen, how we we're going to respond. You see, we, New Life Church, we are, I said earlier that we were the Ninevites in the story, and we are, but we're also Jonah in the story. We are the people of God. 
who have been called to a hostile world to give them the gospel, how will we finish the story? God is saying to us about our city, should I not be concerned about this great And Louisville is a great city. Louisville is a great city, and God's heart burns with passion for it because it exists. Louisville exists whether we know it or not, whether we believe it or not. Our city exists for God's glory and for his pleasure. So his heart is for it. Is yours. Or are we more like Jonah and James and John? Burn them up. How will the story end? Father, I pray that right now in just these next few moments, that as we do these things, that you instruct humble and pray and seek and turn, that you will hear from heaven and you will heal and you will forgive. So Holy Spirit, I just invite your presence right now to guide this time of intercession. In Jesus' name. Now I'm going to, I want us to spend some time praying for our, our city and for this nation. I'm going to ask those who I've asked to join me on stage, they're going to pray with me to come up right now. There's three of you, if you guys could go ahead and come on up and join me here on the stage. body if you could come on up and I've asked these three to come up yeah come on up here and um, I've asked them to join me up here to pray and they're each representing kind of a different group and I want to introduce them to you first because when we start praying I want it just to be fluid and led by the spirit this is Fadi right over here Fadi is from Iraq Actually, he hails from his parents were born in Nineveh. So Fadi is going to pray as representing the descendants of a, of, a, of a city who repented. And he's going to lead us in prayer uh, as that representative. In fact, Fadi was sharing with me that, that uh, even to this day, some Christians in Nineveh still maintain a, a three, every year they fast for three days because the text says that uh, Nineveh was so big it took three days to get through it for Jonah. And, and Christians to this day, because, listen, Nineveh is not an imaginary place, it's a real place. This story we're talking about isn't fairy tale, this is not myth or legend. And so even to this day, the, some Christians in Nineveh, they, they, they fast for three days. And so he's going to pray and he's going to lead us in prayer first and and he's going to pray in Arabic, and, and just in case some of you are kind of, you know, rusty on your Arabic, just know God speaks Arabic too. And so you can just pray for our city and our nation in English while he's praying in Arabic, and the Holy Spirit knows what's happening. You know, I feel like sometimes you can agree in the Spirit, even when you might not figure out all the words, but in the Spirit, there's a unity. And then Jessica is going to pray. Uh, she's going to pray. Jessica's from Peru. And she is going to represent uh, Spanish-speaking peoples in our nation and globally. And she's going to pray and represent that. And then I've asked Rodney Elsey, who's one of our elders uh, here at New Life. I've asked him to lead in prayer on two things. One is Rodney was a Marine. Oh, I guess once a Marine, always a Marine. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So Rodney's a Marine, and I just, I believe that we need to pray for our military. And Rodney has a son-in-law who's a major in the LMPD. And so Rodney's also going to pray for our police officers. Because um, I think we need to do that. I think we need to pray for our police. And then I'm going to close it. And I'm going to pray for racial healing and justice in our nation, okay? So we're going to pray, and as we do that, I'm going to invite anybody who wants to. If you guys, and, and look, if you want to just stand where you are, that's great. If you want to come down here to the front 
and kneel or stand. And just If you're going to be close to people, put on your mask or, or try to distance one or the other, okay? And we're going to pray for our nation. So will you join us? I'm going to ask Fadi to lead us off. Thank you, Jesus. إلهنا الحي القدوس يا رب أنت إلهنا أنت أبونا يا رب أنت أنت رعينا يا رب نشكرك لأجل محبتك يا رب نشكرك لأجل صلاحك ونعمتك يا رب وطول أناتك ولطفك يا رب أنك تشفق علينا يا رب وعلى شعبك يا رب نشكرك لأجل كل الزمان يا رب وفي كل مكان أنت شفقت على شعبك يا رب ورحمت شعبك يا رب في نينوى يا رب وفي كل مكان يا رب نشكرك يا رب على طول أناتك على رحمتك يا رب وصبرك من أجلنا يا رب رغم ضعفاتنا ورغم أخطائنا يا رب إحنا جايين يا رب اليوم وقدامك يا رب نقف عن يا رب عن شعبنا يا رب عن الشعب العربي يا رب عن كل يا رب عايش كل من عايش يا رب في هالبلد يا رب في أمريكا يا رب في كل الولايات وفي كل العالم يا رب كل الناس يا رب اللي يا رب هم يا رب مبتعدين عنك يا رب احنا نتوب عن خطايانا يا رب احنا اولا يا رب احنا اخطانا قدامك يا رب والشر قدامك صنعنا يا رب نتوب على كل ما فعلته ايدينا يا رب من خطا يا رب قدامك يا رب احنا نتوب عن خطايانا وعن خطايا اهالينا يا رب وشعبنا يا رب في العراق يا رب وفي نينوى يا رب وعن كل الشعب العربي يا رب والعراق يا رب في امريكا نتوب عن شعب هالمدينه يا رب عن لوفل يا رب وعن كنتاكي يا رب عن كل الولايات يا رب نطلب رحمة يا رب رحمتك ونعمتك يا رب على هالمدينة يا رب نطلب رحمتك على نينا وأهلا يا رب نطلب رحمتك على العراق يا رب نطلب رحمتك على بغداد يا رب رحمتك على يا رب على لوفل يا رب تعالوا تحنن يا رب على لوفل يا رب على هالمدينة يا رب العظيمة يا رب اللي دعي اسمك عليه يا رب تحنن يا رب على كنتاكي يا رب على كل الولايات يا رب يا رب أصلي يا رب نتعامل معنا يا رب مع شعبك يا رب إنه ترد كثيرين إلى شخصك في هذه الأيام يا رب قبل فوات الأوان يا رب خلص كثيرين وكثيرات يا رب اشفق وتحنن يا رب إله الحي القدوس يا رب تعال بمراحم كثيرة يا رب ارسل روحك يا رب وخلص شعبك يا رب جدد وجه الأرض يا رب سامحنا يا رب عن كل يا رب شيء احنا تعاوننا بين يا رب إنه نحيد يا رب الشعب أو يا رب الأمة يا رب عن طريقك وعن كلامك يا رب صل يا رب أن ترجع الأمة إلى شخصك يا رب الناس التوب وتعرفك يا رب سلم حياتها إلك يا رب في اسم يسوع آمين Father God, we praise you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father, because your word is clear. If we humble ourselves, if we seek you, Father, you will forgive. You will heal our land, Father God. And that's what we come today for you, Father God. This city is a huge city, Father God, that embraces people from so many countries. We have a huge population of refugees, Father God. People coming from South America, from Central America, from all over the world. The question for us today, Father God, is what is my part in this city? It doesn't constrain only to the walls of my house. But what is my role in this city? The city where our kids go to school. Where we go to work. Where we network with friends, Father God. What is our part? I pray, Father God, that as your people... We come back to you, Father God. We lay down, Father God, all those thoughts, ideas that we have in our brains. And that we will submit our thoughts to your will, to your word. And that based on that, Father God, we will humble ourselves. Recognizing, Father God, that whatever we think is not the truth, but your truth is the one that stands. And I humble myself, Father. And we seek you. Allow us, Father God, to walk on the plans that you have outlined for this city. Help us have the revelation, Lord, that we do make a difference. We do make a difference. The same way, Father God, that we pray to impact the lives of our children, of our husbands or wives, Father God, of our family. We also have a huge part in this city, Lord, in this nation, Things happen the way they're happening right now because your people are sleeping. Wake us up, Father God, and have mercy because we have been asleep for so long. Give us a revelation, Father, of who we are in you. And what is the effect and the power that we will have on the people around us and in this nation because of you. Not because of us, but because of you. Because you are perfect. 
I pray, Father God, for all my brothers and sisters that are not aligning in your will right now, Father God, because they got a reaction from somebody within the church, within your body, that they didn't like. Father God, give them the revelation that you are perfect. That that brother or sister that act up and they didn't like it, it's not about them, it's not about you. Give us a revelation, Father. We seek you and we recognize, Father God, that we are nothing without you. Absolutely nothing. My job, my house, whatever I have, is nothing if I don't have you, Father God. Have mercy, Lord. Heal our land. Heal our hearts. And allow us to make the impact that you want us to make while our days are being counted in this world. Because you didn't place us in Louisville, Kentucky, just so we can have what we have right now. You want us to be your hands, your feet. That's what you want. And I pray, Father God, that you will still and give us that revelation so all together as your body will work together, Father God, to make a difference in this nation. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Father God, we just thank you and we praise you, Lord, that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. And Father God, we thank you that you put people in our path, Father God, to do the things that some of us just can't do, Father God. The military and the police officers being some, Father God. So Lord, we thank you for them, Father God. We thank you, Lord, that you're providing for them, Father God. That, Lord, that you're providing per, per protection for each and every one of them, Father God. Lord, I pray that you would just continue to stretch out your hand, Father God, over our military, Father God. Lord, I pray that you work through them, Father God, and with them, Father God, for them to answer the call that they ha you have placed upon their heart, Father God. Lord, I thank you, Father God, that they stand by ready to answer the call, Father God, to go out and protect each and every one of us as citizens, Father mm -hmm. God. And Lord, we thank you and we praise you, Father God that they will be protected, Father God. Lord, I pray that you give them vision, Father God. I pray that you give them wisdom, Father God. Lord, that they will always be one step ahead of the enemy, Father God. Mm -hmm. Lord, that they would know what's coming from the east and the west, the north and the south, Father God. Lord, your word, Father God, will alert them, Father God, to the enemy, Father God. And Lord, I pray that you give them peace, Father God. I thank you, Father God, that they don't have to have fear because fear is not of you, Lord God. Right. Fear is not of you, Father God, and they can be above and beyond that, Father God, because of the, the love that they have for you, Father God. And Lord, I thank you and I praise you for our police officer, Father God, out on doing these hard times, Father God. Lord, I pray that you stretch out your hand over them also, Father God, and protect them and keep them, Father God. Lord, let them do the work that they've been called to do, Father God. Lord, let us, let us as a, a nation respect the authority and, the, and, and work with them and not against them, Father God. Lord, I pray through all of this, Father God, that you bring unity, Father God. You bring respect, Father God. You bring the love of one another, Father God, through all of this, Father God. Lord, we know you're bigger than this, Father God. For your word said you're bigger than this, Father God. And you have many things in store for each and every one of us, Father God. So, Lord, we just thank you and we praise you, Father God, for where we're going to go from here, Father God. We thank you and we praise you, Father God, for the past that you have chosen for each and every one of us, Father God. Lord, I thank you, and I, I honor you, Father God. Yes. We exalt you as Lord of Lord and King of King, Father That's God. Right. You are the Almighty, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. And we give you praise for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, we do, as we are praying right now, Lord, we are turning around, Lord. We pray for our nation. Lord, we repent for the sins of our nation. Several times in Scripture when people just in identification with their nation repented, Lord, we do that for our nation. We ask you to forgive us for the sins of abortion and other things, Lord, sins that we've committed. Lord, we ask your forgiveness. We repent, Lord. We turn away from that. Your promise is that we repent and we turn to you. We seek your face, Lord, that you'll hear from heaven. You'll forgive our sins and heal our land. So, Lord, we pray for that. Lord, I 
I ask forgiveness for the sins of racism in our past, slavery in our past, racism and racial injustice in the present. Lord, we repent of that sin. Turn away from that, Lord. And Lord, I pray for what we need most in this nation, which is a supernatural revival of men and women turning to you, turning away from their sins, turning away from being Lord of their own life and seeing you, Jesus, as the name that is above every name. And Lord, we know there's coming a day when every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But Lord, we do that today. We bow our knee to you today and say, Jesus, you are Lord. And Lord, we intercede on behalf of our nation. Lord, we're in a time where we need you. We need a touch from you. We need wisdom. We need a move of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, you have instructed us in Scripture to pray for those who are governing authorities over us. So I pray for the president. I pray for the governor. I pray for the mayor of our city. I pray for the city council. Lord, I pray, Father, for anyone in government ruling over us. Lord, no matter where they are in their walk with you, would you get a hold of them and draw them to yourself, Lord. And let them rule with righteousness. Lord, let this nation be a place where righteousness is established. And may our city be known, not for chicken and horses and bourbon, but Lord, may our city be known as a place where Jesus is exalted, where the power of the Holy Spirit is seen and experienced. And Father, there is the enemy of our souls on a moment like this wants to lie to us and say, you're just saying words, it's not going to make a difference. But Lord, we know better that you are the God of the impossible. You are the God with whom nothing is impossible. And so our faith is in you. It's in nothing else, Lord. We just declare it just as a church, Lord, for us as a church, our faith is in you. Jesus, you are Lord over New Life Church. We belong to you, so we're with you. So may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And God, I ask that as we go from here today, we do it as people who carry God's heart for this city and for our nation. That we reflect your heart. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive the blessing as we're dismissed today. Go today with God's heart for the nations and our nation. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.